Welcome to the Stepmom Side with Alicia Crasco, the podcast for stepmoms ready to create the life they want and one they actually have a say in. Here we talk all things stepmom life and just a little bit more. Leave the superficial conversations at the door and get ready for perspective shifts and actionable advice to help you on your way to creating the life you want. One step at a time. Hi, Sharon. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. I'm so happy to be here. I'm super pumped that you're here. Like I love what you talk about and what you stand for. So my audience may not know you. So can you give us like your elevator pitch? Like what are you like? What do you have going on? Yeah. So I I call myself a relationship coach and then I added this communication expert, which is it totally brings up all of my imposter syndrome, but <laughs> I do have a podcast about communication and it has a hundred episodes. So I think I, I can, I can totally claim that in addition to all of my training, but my main goal with my coaching business and the work that I do is to help women navigate challenges in their marriages without feeling like a bully or a doormat. So how do we have these kind of tough conversations in a way that we both feel good about what's happening and how it's helping our relationship move forward. So that's really my whole, my whole spiel um, with my coaching business. And I work mostly with women. That's my experience. Women who are, who are married or in committed relationships. And we work on, on healthy communication and navigating conflict. I love that you talk about relationships and the communication part of it, but then the fact that you even touched on like the imposter syndrome, because even though I'm a stepmom coach, like I've been doing it for over a decade. So like, who am I to be telling people like how to run their life or, you know, like different techniques. Right. So it sounds like that's kind of where you are too. Like, wait, yeah, telling you how to communicate. Yeah. Well, and the thing that I think is unique about me also that maybe we can just touch on really quick. So I grew up in a family of boys. I have all brothers. And then I went and got two engineering degrees and I've worked in engineering and training and project management, mostly with men for the past 15 years. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I have a lot of experience working with men, not just in my own intimate relationship, yeah. but professionally. And I've really just been, just been, uh, what's the word? Just, I, li- I live in a world of men and I'm a strong woman. We were talking about this before the podcast, like I'm a strong, assertive person, which doesn't always land well with men. So yeah. figuring all of that out for myself, has been a big part of my journey and helping women kind of navigate that balance between being assertive and being compassionate, being able to be heard that it's just so important. And I just, yeah, like I said, that sad imposter syndrome, I'm just like, yes, I've been, I've been surrounded by men my whole entire life. I do have some perspective to share here and I need to just like, just own that. Yeah. Especially since from really young, like you've only, you only have brothers and trying four of them. You said, right. I have three brothers. Oh, three. There's four of you. Yeah. Trying to get your voice out when you are the only girl. Oh, (laughs) I'm not sure that it's like super hard. Okay. So did you start relationship coaching with the specialty of communication because of your relationships or because of like your background with men? So it really was my marriage that, that pushed me into this area. And honestly, when I started my coaching business, I started coaching in 2019. I remember working with a business coach right early on. And uh, I started kind of doing some market interviews and stuff. And I wanted to help women. I wanted to help working moms kind of calm the chaos in their lives. That was my that was my goal. And because I'm a naturally pretty organized person and I, I have a lot of balls in the air always and it. And I've been able to manage that well. And I was like, okay, I'm going to help women with this. I'm talking to the business coach and I'm telling her about my experience talking to, to, you know, prospective clients and who I want to work with. And I was like, you know, I'm really struggling because navigating conflict over family responsibilities with my husband has almost ended my marriage. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel confident 
working on this with women when it's been such a struggle for me. And she just noticed something about the way that I was talking about it and pointed it out to me. And it totally changed my perspective. I realized how much I was pushing. And once I realized that awareness of the push and I changed that in my marriage, it, you know, it took us from what, what Terry real calls stable misery into actually collaborating. And I was like, okay, if I can work through this conflict in my marriage and household responsibilities has not been the only conflict in my marriage, but it has been the biggest ongoing mm-hmm. conflict. If I can get past this and still feel like I have my sense of self, because that was the thing that I felt like for so long, my husband and I saw at least five counselors in the four, first seven years of our marriage. Like it was a, it was a thing. I was like, I'm not willing to die on this hill. I'm not willing to be this passive submissive coddling wife. We've got to figure something else out. And we just weren't, you know, like I said, I was pushing and we just weren't making the progress that I wanted to. And I can't remember why I said this, but just being able to address that without losing that part of me that was so important. It just felt like this is something a lot of women are looking for. Mm -hmm. And I, not only to figure it out for myself, but to be able to help other women figure that out, to still keep that strong, assertive part of themselves and have a healthy collaborative relationship is just so important for the time that we live in now when having that traditional marriage, it's just, it's just not going to make everyone happy. I agree. (laughs) Especially when you've got typically now two people working. Oh yeah. It's so incredibly hard to, okay. I'm only going to do these things and you're only going to do these things. That doesn't work in my marriage. Um, like when my oh. husband's gone, he's gone. But then on the days that he's home, he's home the entire day. So it doesn't make sense for me to still be doing a hundred percent of all of the things that I do when he's gone, when he's here. And we've got, you know, we had talked about this too. Like it's very fluid in our relationship, like who's doing what and when, right? Like sometimes I'm the one that's cooking, not very often because he's a way better cook than I am, but that's a different story. But like, I'm a better cleaner up. So whoever is in charge of making dinner, the other one is cleaning up. Whoever did dinner is doing bedtime, you know? So we, we alternate like who's doing what. And it's definitely more of, a shared mental load. Is it perfect 100% of the time? Absolutely not. There are faults for sure. Everyone's got days. You know, there are days that he's got things going on that I'm picking up extra. There's things that I've got going on and he's picking up extra. But let me ask you this, like what would be the best way to talk about unmet needs or expectations in your marriage or in your relationship? Because I think that's something I absolutely struggled with as a stepmom. But like, just in relationships, how would you advise somebody or what tips would you give somebody to talk about those unmet needs? I think it's so important. I mean, there's, there's so many parts to this, but um, you have to understand what they are yourself. Mm -hmm. I think often we have this very surface level understanding of our unmet needs. We have, maybe it comes across as a complaint or an expectation that hasn't been expressed. But when I coach my clients on this, we kind of try and look a little bit deeper beneath the surface. You know, like one of the things that my husband and I are always talking about is like date night, for example, you know, it's really important to me that we spend some time away from the house together, focused on each other, because my home is not it's a, it's a space where I'm, I'm relaxed, but it's not a relaxing space for connection often because I see everything that's not done that needs I to hear be you. done. I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. Like everything is screaming at you, right? The dishes, the sewing, the, this, the, that, right. I know exactly what you're talking about. So, so for me, date night is very important. It, it doesn't have that same value for my husband. And so, you know, just understanding that, that my unmet need is not going to be as important to you as it is to me. 
Mm-hmm. And that doesn't have to be, I think sometimes when we express our needs, we're, we're coming at this convincing mode. Like I need this to be as important to you as it is to me. Mm-hmm. And so we just need to like obliterate that expectation and just be like, you know what? I can ask for something and not have it be as important to you as it is to me. Yeah. And I, so, you know, I could say, I, you know, it's really important to me that we have some time together where we're not distracted by the kids and things that need to be done at home and all of these things and going on a date once a week is a really great way for me to fill that cup outside of the house, please outside of the house. (laughs) Exactly. It's not like, you know, watching Netflix after the kids are in bed is just not doing it for me. So when we can explain like the purpose of it, rather than just the request that makes it a little bit more powerful than just like, Hey, we never go out, you know? And that's the thing, you know, a lot of our complaints are just requests expressed in a uh, complaint. Oh, huh? In a complaint, in a complaint. Yeah. So, so if you can see that complaint and be like, Oh, how can I flip this around and make it into a request? And how can I express why it's important to me? Mm -hmm. And then you can kind of, another thing that's really powerful about this is then you can make an agreement. Agreements, especially when we're moving beyond what we're talking about, we're moving beyond these traditional gender roles. We need a lot more communication and a lot more agreements than we needed when it was just like, mom does everything in the house. Dad makes the money and takes care of the cars in the yard. Like Mm -hmm. you don't need a lot of communication about roles and responsibilities when it's all set in stone but the way we're doing things now for a lot of families that just it doesn't work Mm -hmm. for men or women very well so we need a lot of communication and we need a more awareness of what our needs are yeah Uh, so can you touch on what is more important than saying the right thing in a tough conversation? Because I feel like that kind of ties in and we kind of talked about this off camera too, but sometimes we are so caught up in saying the right thing or being right. You know, there's that saying like, would you rather be right or happy? Like it took me a long time to understand what that meant. Oh, me yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, I, but I'm right. Like, I know, but I am right. Like everything is a competition. And I'm going to win because I'm right. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So saying the right thing, this was another lesson that I learned and that just became so important to me. You know, I felt like for so long I was reading all the books. I was listening to the podcasts. You know, there are, there's a lot of great books about communication out there. Like, and they lay out this very like perfectly orchestrated script of how, how to bring things up. And I felt like I was doing that for so long and I wasn't getting the results that I wanted. I still wasn't feeling heard. I still wasn't feeling valued. And I finally just realized like, I'm, I'm so wrapped up in saying the right thing that I'm not being totally honest or vulnerable. And, and, and just being like, this is really frustrating for me to be in this situation. I, it, it, it's painful in a way to feel like I'm expressing myself and I'm not being heard. There was one moment when, and my husband and I, we would talk about this in therapy sometimes. And the therapist would be like, your husband really wants you to just like butter him up before you. And I was like, I, I'm not a sugar coater. I'm not, I, I need to find a way to communicate that doesn't like go against who I feel like I am at the core Um, So that, you know, so I felt like I did that one time and I just like buttered him up really good. And then I expressed what I needed. And my husband was like, well, since you brought it up the right way, I guess I will. And I was like, this cannot be how our marriage works. Like I cannot coddle you to the point of like making you feel like you can do no wrong. And I'm in the wrong to even ask something of you. This cannot be how our marriage works. Yeah. So, so being vulnerable and being honest in a way that that's kind and really taking ownership of that. Like, this is hard for me to, to share this and feel this way. I'm trying to think of a better example 
than that. But the other thing that's really helpful in this is this principle that I learned, and it took me way longer to learn this than I care to admit, (laughs) but the principle of charitable interpretation or just giving someone the benefit of the doubt. What does that even mean? So, (laughs) so just just, (laughs) like, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not giving you the benefit of the doubt. Just like not, not taking things so personally and feeling like, there you know my terry real talks about everyone has this core negative image of their spouse you know i see my husband as lazy and like doing the bare minimum that's my core negative image of him and his core negative image of me is I have too high of expectations and i'm i'm demanding and i'm never satisfied and if we can just like lay that out on the table and say like yes this is this is how i see you when when things are hard and it's not a completely accurate portrayal of you you're actually you know maybe he is a little bit more laid back than i am but that doesn't mean that he's a total uh what's a good word he's just a total slug you know he he yeah, has a yeah. he has a job he works hard he just he just doesn't see things the same way as I do at home so just being able to to value his perspective and say hmm like I wonder what it would look like if I could actually just like lay on the couch and have a nap even if there's dishes in the sink maybe that maybe that's not such a bad thing maybe I could practice doing some of that too right I think sometimes we struggle as women to give ourselves the permission though to just lay on the couch and do nothing Yes. And because you're doing that, I'm pissed that you are. Right. And it's just like, you can also lay on the couch, even though your mental list is a million miles long. Like you can take five minutes and do that sometimes. And I, you know what, to be honest with you, I struggle with that sometimes too. Like full disclosure, like it's not easy for me to just sit and be like that. I'm always like, oh, I could be doing this or I could be doing that right. or I could be listening to a podcast or whatever the case may be, where my husband has no problem being like, let's stare at the wall. I'm like, I would love to do that. And so he will say, well, why don't you? Because there's a million things to do. And he's like, okay, they're still going to be there tomorrow too. I'm like, I know. I know. Yes. You're right. You're right. Okay. Can you touch on how do women get more support in their house without mothering their parents? When I saw this was a question that you answer, I'm like, that is gold. Like, let's talk about that. How do you get more support without feeling like you're mothering your spouse? Yes. I think so often women get into this and I think it's because this is the, what's been modeled for us. Like when I, when I'm in like online forums or anything, women will always be like, Oh, you just need to give him a list of chores or um, just tell him, or you know there's this whole common thing with men of like just tell me what you need help with and I'll do it and that puts so much of the burden on us still and um and my husband is stubborn enough that he's not he's not going to go along with that and I'm sure some of the audience is that way too but I was actually on a podcast with some Christian men and I I don't think they're even going to publish the episode (laughs) because what I said was not what they wanted to hear But, you know, they they had this attitude of, oh, you just need to delegate to me. And I to me, that's not partnership. Mm -mm. But also, you know, I think we we need something to bridge the gap between because we also have this expectation of like, well, I'm able to notice what needs to be done and just do it. So my husband should, too. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's not been working for most people either. Yeah. So my, my suggestion when I work with my clients and I actually have a worksheet and it's, it's on my list of links that I'll share with you guys called a weekly partnership check-in. And so the idea here is we're going to make like progress every single week <laughs> mm-hmm. rather than expecting like this whole 180 change overnight and a, a lot of times what happens with women is they blow up and I'm not getting enough help and let's let's do something different and if they have a husband who's collaborative enough he'll step in for a while and then things will go back to the way that they used mm-hmm. to be so I, I mentioned a little bit earlier like we need some very clear and explicit agreements and then we need to be following up on those agreements and making sure that they're working and the first thing that i have on this worksheet is talk about what's going well 
Yeah. Because we do, we need to celebrate. And this is something that I'm terrible at personally, but we need to celebrate what's already working. We, you know, we might not feel like anything is working right now, but that's just not true. You know, my husband, he wakes up every morning and he goes to work and he has a steady job and that's working really well. And I do appreciate that a lot. And, you know, there's other things that even, even when we were at our very worst and I felt like I wasn't getting any support at home, there were still things that he was doing that I could count on him to do. And we need to celebrate those things. And then we can talk a little bit more about improvement. And one of the things I coach my clients on often is we just need to choose one thing at a time. Yes. Like, like what's, what's either going to be an easy win or what's our biggest pain point right now. And let's just tackle that one thing. <laughs> yes. Yes. Cause we have a, you know, it's going to take, honestly, for most people, it's going to take years to renegotiate all of these patterns mm-hmm. that we've been ingrained in for so long. So what's one thing that we can focus on? The other thing that I think is really important for a lot of women, and this is something that Eve Rodsky talks about in the book, Fair Play, which I highly recommend that. for, yeah. mm-hmm. for this thing is um, often men get more leisure time than women do. Mm-hmm. So how can we like make an explicit agreement that we each have some time for leisure. And then if you're like me and probably most people listening to this podcast, because women who are into personal development have a really hard time giving themselves leisure time. But what am I going to do during my leisure time? That's actually leisure. Yeah. And not reading another self-help thing or listening to a self-help podcast. (laughs) Exactly. So that I think is really important. And then, um, And then dividing, and this is straight out of the book, Fair Play, dividing the dirty dozen in a way. And I was just listening to another one of your podcasts and you're talking about, you know, fair is not always equal, but what's going to feel fair for us this week? I'm going to put my, you know, my husband is going to agree to being in charge of dishes and I'm going to let him own that completely for the week. And we're going to agree on that. Mm -hmm. And then the next week we're going to follow up and how did it go? Did we feel like it went well and what needs to be adjusted? You know, my husband, like I said, he's, he's a more laid back person than me. And he kind of resists these explicit agreements. Like he said to me before, he's like, well, I just think we should all just help out and, and work together and just, just do what needs to be done. And I've had to say to him, like, I know that sounds really great to you. However, I am the person who naturally does more than you do just by my nature. Mm -hmm. And so if we do it that way, I'm always going to be feeling like I'm doing more and like you're not pulling your weight. So we need these explicit agreements. And and of course, you know, and I'll tell him this, like if it's your turn to do the dishes and you don't feel up to doing it, I don't want you to just lay on the couch And think, oh, she's going to notice that I need some extra help and she's going to pitch in and do it. I want you to ask me, you know, when when something is your responsibility and you don't feel up to doing it, I want you to just say, hey, can I get a little extra help here? Mm -hmm. And that's where I feel like we can have we can have explicit agreements, but we can also have flexibility Mm -hmm. in our agreements as well. And that to me is how we treat our partners like an adult instead of mothering them or or nagging them hey you need to do your chores you need to do your chores it's like nope we made an agreement and you know part of our agreement with dishes is if you don't get to them and you don't ask for my help then they just pile up until you do them and that happens a few times and we can talk about it and we can say hmm this agreement isn't working out quite the way we wanted it to what what's another way of doing it or oh I don't really like having the dishes pile up so I I guess I will feel a little bit more motivated to do them. But for me, that's, that's where we, we quit mothering our spouses and we start partnering with them is, is with the explicit conversations and the agreements and then the follow-up. I think that's where, where a lot of this falls apart for a lot of people is, oh, well, he did it for a couple of weeks and then it stopped. And it's like, well, are you talking about it regularly or are you just expecting things to change with a single conversation? And I think that's where 
the the fall apart happens because there isn't a follow up and this is it's more than like relationship stuff though like your intimate relationships because it transpires or like transcends like different relationships like your kids your in-laws colleagues like your spouse your partner like whoever you come into contact with and thank you for touching on the because this made me I tried so hard not to laugh which is pretty good for me when you said when the you said that your husband said why don't we all just help out and like everyone just pitches in? Yeah, that would be great if that's what was actually happening. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's right. Not and if we if we had the same standards for what yeah. needs to be done at home and we both had the same like energy and commitment level yeah, to making yeah. that happen, that would work. But most couples, they, no, you know, not. it just we're just not paired up that way. <laughs> Yeah. And I, you and I sound very similar, like high expectations, very driven, like always doing something like where our husbands are a lot more laid back. My husband is a lot more laid back too. He's like the calm to my storm or like the ice to my fire, if you will. And I have had to work on my expectations and like my expectations are high and I'm willing to die on that hill to meet them, but not everyone else is willing to die on that hill to meet them as well. Yes. Right? And you roll your eyes like, you know. Yeah. Oh, I totally know. And I think that's such an important part of it is we are trying to meet in the middle here. We're not trying to bring a child up to the parents standard. We are treating our spouse like a partner and being yeah. like, okay, yes, maybe we can have frozen burritos one night a week to lighten our load. Maybe we can vacuum once a week instead of three times a week or (laughs) I'm like a perfect vacuumer and that was like a huge contention point for me like my stepkids at eight and 11 didn't vacuum perfectly like I did my husband doesn't vacuum perfectly like I did but I was willing to die on the hill until I was able to get a hold of myself and just be like they weren't raised how you were raised they didn't have a grandmother that would make them vacuum the entire room is it worth the emotional turmoil that it puts in your relationship it's not right stop like stop doing it yeah 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 we do have to remember that and I (laughs) you and I are similar we have to remember that we're talking to somebody that we love and that we want to have like a lasting affectionate relationship with not just like a working relationship yes I completely agree and how you said you have to treat them like an adult not a child that you're trying to bring up and even you know, just to dissect this a little bit, even with children, you can't do that to them either. Right. Like our daughter, like we've always talked to her like an adult because that that's the end game. You know, like she is eventually at some point going to grow up and be an adult. Apparently when she turned four, she was going to become the adult. That's what she told us. So she's an adult now at four years old or whatever. (laughs) But yeah, like you've got to manage your own expectations and recognize what hills are you actually willing to die on and what part of it is not working in your relationship and seeing that part of it. And, you know, like you too, I have to manage my expectations and I have to be cognizant of being happy and maybe not necessarily right and understand what I'm saying, because I can be extremely harsh. I know that I can be it I'm because I'm being very direct but I want to have a lasting, loving relationship, like you said. And is that beneficial? And it's not. Not if I'm being super harsh. Intentionally or not. Sometimes it is intentional. But when it's, you know, like, it's still like that's damaging. Mm-hmm. And how do you get around that, right? And it's about fixing your tone, fixing the way that your face is contorted when you're speaking. <laughs> do you have that problem too? Oh, I don't know if it's the face. It's definitely the tone. It's definitely the like, why haven't you figured this out already? Like, are you an idiot? Yeah. Yeah. And I like I I say this to my kids often because I don't even know where my eight year old picked this up. But it's like, what the heck is wrong with you is like not (laughs) it's it's not a phrase we're allowed to say to each other because it's just not a loving thing to say to somebody. But I can see where they get it from. Like, it's so being a parent is so eye opening of like, oh, my gosh, we're like, no wonder we talk to each other the way we do as adults because of how children are spoken to. It's just 
uh, it's a it's a whole nother layer of self-awareness when I hear just all of that going on. Is that what I sound like? Oh gosh. Yeah. Right. It really puts into check like what you say and what is coming out of their mouth or when they talk back to you or they repeat back, like what you're saying. Yeah. Like you said, like, what the heck is wrong with you? Where did you get that from? (laughs) Okay. So let me ask you this. What can someone do to improve a relationship if their spouse is checked out or if their partner is checked out? Like, how do they get around that? Like, okay, they've tried asking nicely. They've tried, you know, saying something in a different way. What do they do if they can't, or just like they're checked out? I, they feel like I, yeah, I think this is something that, you know, my, I, I've, I've mentioned this before, but I've always kind of been the one to be like, let's go to therapy. Let's do, Mm -hmm. let's whatever. I'm, I'm kind of the one instigating all of those things. And my husband's a little bit more withdrawn and I wouldn't say he's a total, um, he's totally against personal development and all of that stuff, but he's just not as interested in it as I am. And I think, you know, being vulnerable, being honest about, how that impacts you is really important. I think it's also really important. We, um, I think we put so much pressure on our marriage to fulfill everything that we want and need out of life. And for me, it's been really important to broaden my circle of support. You know, there are a few things that I can only get from my husband. You know, we're, we're, we're monogamous. That's part of the agreement of our relationship. So there are, you know, there are things that, that I ask for only from him, but I think it's really important to have girlfriends that you can talk to like girlfriends and not expect your spouse to be that part for you Mm -hmm. um to have you know if being involved in your community is important go be involved in your community if you love travel and they don't take your kids on a trip or go with some girlfriends so making sure that you're kind of extending that circle of support is really important um figuring out where you know, what your blind spots are and working on that. That's been, you know, we've kind of talked about our, some of our blind spots and um, just expressing, you know, it's really important to me that we do this. And this is why without having to convince, I think, like I said before, with the date night, not needing them to value the same things as we do as much as we do, but making those very clear requests. Like I want to go on a date night once a week or what other ways can you see to, to fulfill that need for me? You know, knowing that you're willing to do that for me is really important. I just had a conversation with a woman who um, her husband had been, um, unfaithful to her I think it was an emotional affair it wasn't a physical affair but it was an emotional affair and she wanted more access to his phone than he was willing to give her and she's like how do I approach this conversation and I think that's when you need to be really grounded Mm -hmm. in who you are and what you expect you know you we can't go into that convincing like Mm -hmm. you know so often in these conversations we're trying to convince them that what we're asking for is valid and we have to decide that for ourselves we have to learn how to self-validate and the, the way that I kind of suggested to her to approach this conversation was to say it's important to me that I'm able to trust you and that being trusted is important to you. And this is what trust looks like to me because you've, you know, had inappropriate conversations with women on your phone in order for me to feel like I can trust you. I need to feel like you're willing to let me look at your phone. So we're not convincing him that this is a rational request. We're saying, this is what I need. And this is what it looks like. If, if that's not possible in this relationship, then I'm going to reconsider my position in this relationship. Yeah. So one of the things that you talk about is avoiding or ending toxic relationships. And I know that that's like a complete switch because let me just touch on the convincing part of it. Yeah. If you, I'm the kind of person that if you're going to try to convince me to come your way in a situation like this, and I think you would be too, just based on my limited experience to you, I'm going to dig my heels in. I'm not coming your way. 
I'm absolutely not. And my husband knows that well enough now um, where he is a lot more, he will come my way. And the compromise is something that I struggled with a lot at the beginning of our relationship, like so much so that I like put it in our wedding vows and I promised to try to compromise. And it was a word that I've definitely learned what that means. And I do compromise now sometimes against my will, but I know that it's for the better of our relationship if I do compromise and I'm not so black and white anymore. But like in the situation with your client and having an unfaithful spouse, even if it is an emotional affair, which I think almost is worse, but that's a different topic. Yeah. That might be her need now, but it's not always going to be her need, right? So right. that's one of those case by case things. Like she you need this is important now, but it doesn't mean that it's a death sentence by, you know, like for right. life. Yeah, I'm not gonna need to check your phone every week for the rest of forever. But I do need to know that you want me to trust you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that you, you know, of course, when we get into infidelity, there's, there's a whole, you know, there's a Mm -hmm. whole debate about what's appropriate and what's not. But at the, at the very core, like being able to trust each other is going to be a core need for most people in their relationships and each person being responsible for being trustworthy Mm-hmm. And, you know, being able to agree on what that looks like and how we demonstrate that, you're going to have to figure that out in some way or another. Yeah. So what if there, you know, somebody that's listening to this is at that point where they're like, you know what, I think that I might be in a toxic relationship. How do you advise them to either get out of it or if they think that they're starting a relationship and it is going to be toxic and they can see the writing on the wall, how do they avoid it? Yeah, I think it's really important to talk to some sort of professional, whether it's a coach or a therapist, to kind of offer an outside perspective and help you see what you might not be seeing. Um, But especially early on in a relationship, when you don't have kids and you're not married, and that's a really great time to be like, oh, am I, am I, con- you know, am I trying to convince them to invest in me? We don't ever want to be in that position, but, um, but, you know, I, I feel like I've been in this position before where I'm like, oh, I don't feel like my husband is really that invested in our relationship. How can I, you know, I, I mentioned pushing, am I pushing or am I, mm-hmm. am I pulling, am I being more pressuring or am I being more influencing? And it's so hard, you know, as much as we can listen to book, listen to podcasts and read books and all of those things, but self-awareness is so hard to do on your own. Mm-hmm. I would just recommend to anyone who feels like that they're in that position before you make any um, drastic moves to work with somebody who you feel like you can trust to give you a a good assessment of where you're at and what your part in the whole situation is. Because if you don't address it and you leave, you know, I have another client who's in a really difficult marriage and she's like, uh, she's in that same way. Like, how do I know if it's time to call it quits or how long is it going to take for me to know if this relationship can be saved? And it's just like, well, until you start addressing some of these things that you're contributing to the difficulties in the relationship, if you leave today, you're very likely to end up in this same kind of relationship with someone else Mm -hmm. until you figure out what brought you to the place you're in right now. Yeah. I completely agree. So yeah, I think that's like what's wrong, I would say, with the advice of just like, we'll just get out of the toxic relationship or just leave. Or yeah. if you can see it, just go. Because you're right. I a hundred percent like that's exactly what I did. Like I said, I didn't compromise at all. Like it was very much my way or the highway in previous relationships. Mm-hmm. And those ended wonderfully. Let me just like, like just tell you that right now. Like they it doesn't end well, right? Like no one wants to right. be with a dictator. And I was really good at that. And if it things weren't going my way, that's totally fine. Like I was out. So, you know, I can see now like my part in relationships, but then also like when we went to marriage counseling, 
I loved it at first. And I've talked about this before. Like I loved it at first because she was like, oh yeah, this is wrong and that is wrong. And you know, you guys aren't doing this right. You guys, meaning my husband wasn't doing this right. I'm like this lady is wonderful until she turned the mirror to me. And then I didn't like it so much anymore, right? Because then you have to face the music and you see the parts that you don't like. And so I think that your advice on get some help and see where your faults are or see where you're contributing to it. And that is the hard part to sit with that and to see that. Yeah. And own that. Like that's, that's the real hard part. But unless you can get to that point, you're going to keep repeating those patterns. They're your patterns and you think that it's fine. I thought that it was fine until you see that it's not fine and then you can't unsee it. <laughs> oh yeah, it's painful. <laughs> I mean, until you've been in that position where you've really like looked, like you said, looked in the mirror and seen how, oh, <laughs> the what's happening in my marriage. I've dealt with that at work. I've dealt with that with my my siblings and my parents, I've dealt with that with, you know, past relationships. And then you start to see, I am the common denominator in all of these issues. It's not everyone else. Mm -hmm. I've got to deal with that. And if I'm, you know, if I've dealt with it and I've dealt with it well, and this relationship still isn't working, then, you know, or if I need to separate from this person because things are so triggered and so heated that, that I can't focus on the growth that I need. You know, that's another totally valid decision. Um, my husband and I were like unofficially separated for a short period of time. And I think some people are so afraid to do that because they think that's the beginning of the end of the relationship. It doesn't have to be, you know, sometimes you're being with one person who is constantly triggering you all the time can make it really difficult to do the personal work that you need to do to be the kind of person who can be in a long-term relationship. But, you know, I'm not giving like a really clear answer here, but the truth is until you've really dealt with yourself, you're going to keep ending up in the same kind of relationship, even if it's not the person that you're with right now. Yeah. And no one wants to hear that, right? No, no, <laughs> like how I'm good. Um, so you guys have agreements in your marriage. Do you have boundaries? Boundaries, yes, I would say we have boundaries. Um, or are they just kind of like unspoken, but like you guys know, I mean, because you've been together now for 11 years, are they kind of unspoken? Uh, no, we we definitely have to communicate things and re communicate, and sometimes there's um sometimes there's boundaries that get renegotiated, you know, kind of like you were talking about before, like if trust has been an issue in the relationship, trust has been an issue in my relationship. My husband grew up in a family where being honest was not a high value. It was more keep the peace, tell people what you think they want to hear and keep the peace. And so there were some, some things definitely, you know, if I were to sit down with my husband, we have this conversation every once in a while and I'll be like, what's the best thing I've ever taught you? And he's like, that I can be an honest person. Like, Mm -hmm. and, and that's just the truth of, of where we came from and where we're at now. But he, he's more trustworthy now than he used to be. So the boundaries can change. And, um, I'm not answering that question very clearly, but I do believe that healthy relationships need boundaries and the, the clearer you can be with your boundaries, the more freedom you can feel and the more connection you can feel in that relationship. I agree. Um, I saw that you speak on like the difference between boundaries and ultimatums. Can you touch on that really quick? I'm sure that you knew that I wasn't going to go there, but I think. So I I released a podcast episode about this because um, I think often also when we set a clear firm boundary, like this is not okay with me will get accused of giving ultimatums. Mm -hmm. And, and I personally, I, you know, I kind of, I love to like think of the deeper meanings behind, behind some of these words. I don't think that an ultimatum is inherently bad, but I do think that often we use ultimatums in an unhealthy way. 
-hmm. it's really calm you know a common ultimatum is like uh, if you don't do whatever I'm asking you to do then I we're gonna have to get divorced Mm -hmm. (laughs) sometimes we say that in more subtle ways but it's that subtle threat of if you don't give me what I want then I'm gonna end this relationship that Mm -hmm. is usually unhealthy but there was a time in (laughs) in our marriage my husband and this is a, a common a common kind of pattern in relationships where one person is a stonewaller they just like totally That's how I was raised I did that too yep mm-hmm. and I'm I'm not a stonewaller my husband has been a stonewaller in the past and there was one time a few years ago we went on a trip and and we have very different personalities when we're traveling and we got in a huge fight and we got home and my husband was just giving me the silent treatment and a lot of times I I learned this from Gottman. He says that people who stonewall, I mean, it can be for different reasons, but one of the reasons is I don't want to say the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. So it's best for me to just keep quiet. But my husband was was giving me the silent treatment and it had gone on for more than a day. And I said to him, like, this is not acceptable to me. It's emotional abuse. Mm-hmm for you not to speak to me. If this continues, (laughs) we either need to talk to a therapist or we need to talk to a lawyer because I am not going to tolerate this in my relationship. And, um, grow like growing up, I saw some of these kind of emotionally, emotionally abusive behaviors going on for my whole growing up. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just feel so strongly that we need to be strong Mm -hmm. against, against these patterns in our relationships. Sometimes it does take a very strong, firm stance to say, I'm serious about this. We cannot continue this. I'm willing to deal with whatever I've done to contribute to it. I think that's part of what makes it a healthy boundary. I'm willing to do whatever I need to do to, to get past this, but this I'm, I'm not willing to be in a marriage that lasts 40, 50, 60 years where this is acceptable. Yeah. I love that. And it does take a lot to get past that. Um, my parents were divorced and that's like how my mom operated too. Like if things didn't go well, that's what she would do. And so I would do that a while for a while. However, I was not afraid of not saying the right thing. Mm -hmm. I was more ego driven and wanted the groveling which obviously it doesn't go well either. <laughs> right. So, but like once yeah. I get on that part and be like, I, I am not over here sitting on a throne that my husband needs to grovel at. Like that is so ridiculous. Like now I can look back and laugh and be like, but you don't know, we don't know, right? Like you right. are in your environment. Yeah. What we grow up with feels very normal and healthy yeah. to us. And I think when, when we get two people together who come from very different backgrounds, that's when we're like, oh my gosh, my parents are totally messed up. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm in therapy for people that should have been in therapy. What is happening? Yeah. yeah. I completely agree. Uh, yeah. The stonewalling thing is just, yeah, it's crazy. And then when you put the the fact of like, it's a form of emotional abuse on it. Like that was really eye-opening to me. So I was like, well, I'm not emotionally abusive. And then, and then it like, gets to that point where you're like, oh yeah, I'm in therapy, therapy for people that need to be in therapy, right? Like my mom does that. So that's one less thing that I'm going to do because I don't want to be like her, right? It's kind of like the vengeful part of it. Like I'm not doing that. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking about all these things. I'm like, this is incredible. You are such a wealth of knowledge you have. And I love how you can just break things down very simply put. Where can my audience find you online? Where do you live? So, so I'm the same handle everywhere. My, my business is called keep talking revolution. And that's my website. That's my podcast. That's my Instagram handle. And that's where I am on Facebook as well. So you can find me in any of those places. Um, It's just keep talking revolution. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. It was great chatting with you. Thank you. Thanks for taking time to listen to this week's episode. If anything was helpful or resonated with you, please share it on social media and tag me. I'm just at Alicia Crosco. 
And if you could leave a five-star rating and review while you're at it, that would also be really helpful. And if you find yourself struggling with your stepmom journey and you want a little bit more support without the hefty price tag of coaching, you might want to check out the stepmom side community, which is my own private community for stepmoms, where you get to connect with other stepmoms around the world and myself, where I hold weekly office hours and monthly group coaching. It's kind of like you have your own personal coach in your own back pocket. Again, without that hefty price tag. See you next week.